Simona, the emergent framework or idea of aesthetic cognitivism uh, relies on the intellectual foundation of disciplines and ways of thinking. One of the most important is cognitive science. You're an experimental psychologist, so tell me about the kinds of, of work that you do in experimental psychology and understanding cognitive science, and then we'll talk about how it, how it might relate to understanding aesthetic cognitivism. So, of course, any study of the human mind requires a certain method. And the scientific method we use most of the time is coming from cognitive science, uh, the experimental method. So what we try to do is to break down highly complex phenomena into very simple building blocks and try to isolate them experimentally by boiling them down to the basics in a way. Of course, that means we have to simplify things. We have to um, sometimes create almost artificial conditions in the lab, highly controlled ones. And of course, we often get criticized for, for leaving out the complexities of real life. But at the same time, sometimes, or rather often in science, you have to go to the lowest possible level and first understand that level of analysis and then build on that and extrapolate from there and translate it into the real world. So what's a specific example of that from your yes. own work? Well, in fact, relating to perception, which is very relevant yeah. to aesthetics, of course, uh, perception is often seen as something very objective, as a you know, so-called low-level cognitive process. So I see the world as it is. I see you sitting there. You know, you're, of course, a very concrete object that I perceive in space at a certain distance with a certain shape. And it used to be thought that that's a completely, because it's a low-level process, it's completely objective. It's specified by the properties of my visual system mm -hmm. and the stimulus <laughs> out in the world. Uh, but what a lot of research, including ours, has shown is that one can break down that perceptual process into what the perceiver is doing, the role of the perceiver, and whatever it is out in the environment, the object of perception. So to give you one example, we put, we put people out in the real world, for example, ask them to stand at the base of a hill and ask them about their perception. How steep does the hill look to you? It's a very simple question, and of course, it's perfect, the hill, the slant of the hill is perfectly specified by the angle. But what we and colleagues have shown is that the particular state of the person doing the perceiving makes a difference to how they see the world. So for example, if I am full of energy because I just had a sugary drink mm -hmm. with tons of glucose in it, I look at the hill and it becomes more flat. In my mind, because the, that hill that I'm looking at is all about a certain action that I can engage in mm. at that point in time when I feel full of air, energy, as opposed to if I'm really exhausted, then that hill all of a sudden becomes really steep. And, and you can detect an, angle, an angular difference in terms yes, of the perception of the same that's object. Right. Yes. And interestingly enough, one gets the same effect for different types of um, what one can think of resources. So resources... Physio on the physiological yeah. level, so yeah. I'm you know, pumped up because I have tons of glucose in my system, but also um, social resources. So when we ask people to stand by the hill with a friend by their oh. side, mm -hmm. they also find the hill to be less steep. So there's various aspects, um, I suppose psychological factors that feed into perception that might not be entirely obvious if one looks at it as a low-level process. And this is low-level process. Yes. So this is what we would assume you're getting a, a, a perfect correspondence that's it. between our, that's right. our inputs and our senses and exactly. what the world is. And that's in fact, right. that's not the case. That's, that's probably as low as one can get yeah. as far as any sort of cognitive sure. process sure. is concerned. Sure. So even at that level, we find that there is all kinds of contextual factors, factors about the person, the observer, that play a role. So what are the implications of that in terms of the perception of now art, which yes. is several orders of magnitude more right. complex than yes. a simple observation? See, on one hand, it makes life more complicated, scientific life, because of course it introduces a certain level of subjectivity, right? So with a hill, if I happen to be, you know, 
full, if I happen to be alert and full of energy, <laughs> you know, I'm all fired up, then I see one thing, lack thereof, I, I see something different. Mm -hmm. So it becomes more subjective, but at the same time, as long as we can predict these specific states and how they then are uh, correlated with behavior, it, it becomes uh, controllable again, or rather um, experimentally controllable. So as long as we identify whatever these underlying individual differences are at a given moment in time, um, and then you know one can make the same argument for art, that as long as we have some understanding of what the relevant factors are, we can then try to identify them in people, even if people among themselves differ quite a bit. I mean, I've had the experience of listening, for example, to a Mahler symphony, and at one point I'll just hear it and I like it a lot. Yes. But there'll be a few times in life when it will just have a, an emotional kind of electrifying yes, that's you know, right. unification with mm -hmm. the universe kind yes. of feeling. Yes. Rare. Uh, right. The symphony hasn't changed. It, yes. it could be even, even the same recording. That's right. That's right. Um, but it's something in me that's changed. Yes. Exactly, and absolutely, and that's the case with many experiences we have, especially that uh, experiences that evoke emotions, right? So Mahler, for example, we know, in fact, we use it, in my lab, we've used it as a mood induction. Uh -huh. Mahler, I should say, we often use to induce a, a sad mood. <laughs> you know? which, which symphonies do you, um, what do you use for that? To be honest, I can't there? remember no. now, but I suppose but we some take of it's, a... Some of it's uplifting. Yeah, we, well, I suppose we select certain pieces. I mean, I, yeah, the simple third. comparison is Mahler versus Mozart, mm -hmm. right? Mahler making people sad, Mozart making them yeah, feel I, I happy, on average. I think the slow movements of Mahler, yes. I, I can see it's more, That's I, right. I, for me, I, I would say more contemplative than sad, yes. but we won't exactly. get Exactly, <laughs> but, but we look at the contrast, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Mahler sure. versus Mozart. Mozart. Right. Keep it an M, though. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Perfectly controlled. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so, so the point being that one can elicit these emotional states through some aesthetic mm. appreciation mm. of music, for mm. example. Mm. And then because we know that, we can then you know, build on that to say, okay, we induced a certain emotional state, now let's look at the effect of that emotional state on you know, various other outcome variables. So we try to be as systematic as possible try to rule out confounds, um, keep things very controlled. Um, and, you know, that can, make, that can make research challenging because one has to think of lots of things, lots of, um, I guess, variable or kind of error variables that can get in the way. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge, but at the same time, you know, of course, trying to predict human behavior is expected to be challenging, especially whenever there's a social component involved.